Cain kills Abel. Abel, Cain's children kill seven. Cain's grandchildren kill 70 fold. And then Tubal Cain pops up on the horizon and he's the person who makes artifices of war. And so the story in its fragmentary manner ties the individual psychopathology that's resentful and revenge seeking to the proclivity for broad scale warfare. And this really hit me because I was interested particularly in what was happening in the Nazi camps with the guards. Because the guards were gratuitously cruel. And I was very curious about that. And so here's an interesting story. This was in a book called uh, Ordinary Germans. Hitler's Willing Executioners. And it was a book that was written about 30 years ago that challenged the idea that the Nazi phenomena was top-down order following. Which I don't believe, by the way. I think that that's a very uh, weak, weak hypothesis. Fascistic societies are fascistic at every single level of organization. Spiritually, within the family, within the local community, it's like a holograph. It's the same absolutely everywhere. It's not top down. I mean, there are leaders who get produced and maybe they catalyze it, but to blame it on the leaders is to forget about the process by which the leaders come to be. So, no, you don't get a pass that way. So here's one of the things that happened. Um, as the Nazis started to lose the war, so here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the Gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory. And then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. And we assume that Hitler wanted to win. But that's not a very intelligent assumption. Why would you assume that? He wasn't exactly a good guy. So why should we assume that he was aiming at the good that he was promoting, even in his own terms, right? The glorious, everlasting, Fourth, Third Reich, right? That'll rule for a thousand years and be a, a bastion of civilization and music because that's the sort of thing he purported to be interested in. Well, so what do you do with the Jews and the Gypsies? Well, round them up, fine. Enslave them, fine. You don't kill them. You certainly don't devote a substantial proportion of your war resources while you're losing to accelerate the rate at which the extermination is taking place. Because that's a bit counterproductive, unless what you're aiming at is the maximum possible mayhem in the shortest period of time. Well, so what happened as the Germans started to lose the war? Did Hitler lose faith in his own ability? No, he believed that the Germans had betrayed him with weakness. And so he was perfectly willing to ex accelerate the rate at which Germany was losing the war. And so when Hitler and his minions had the choice, here's the choice. You can suspend your unnecessary demolition of people, win the damn war, and then pick it up afterwards. Or while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem, even though it's counterproductive. It's like, what'd they pick? Well, they pick to accelerate the mayhem. And so to me, there's an old psychoanalytic idea. I think this was derived by Jung. If you can't figure out what someone is doing or why, look at the outcome and infer the motivation. If it produces mayhem, perhaps it was aiming at mayhem. Now, you know, you have to use that dictum carefully. If someone's irritating you, you know, maybe it's because you're irritable and you should sort yourself out. But maybe it's because they're actually aiming at irritating you. And that's the actual motivation. So, perhaps not, but it's another tool in your analytical armament. So, <clears throat> and so you see, well, and this is the thing about warfare that's so interesting about, about because you, you, can, you can attribute it to territoriality. You can attribute it to a war for resources. That's what the, I would say, wretchedly simple-minded economists presume. People fight over scarce resources. It's like, hey, we're a little bit more sophisticated than that. And first of all, what resources are you talking about? The bloody Inuit had nothing. They lived perfectly well. What did they have? Snow and seal blubber. You know, people can live in unbelievably deprived conditions. And so, the idea that there are natural resources that we fight over because there's a shortage of them is a pretty oversimplified view of human beings. It's like, well, why do people fight? Well, maybe they fight sometimes for good reasons. But very, very frequently, they fight for bad reasons. And those bad reasons are, are personal as well as sociocultural and economic. You know, if you were a Nazi prison guard, for example, whatever pathologies you were carrying around in your destructive little soul, whatever element of Cain was deeply embedded in you, had the opportunity to be manifest fully at every moment of your waking existence, right? You had these people who were completely beholden to you, with no rights whatsoever, 
to whom you could do whatever your evil little heart determined. You think, well, maybe that was a motivation for putting them there to begin with. And all the cover story about, well, we're trying to build the Third Reich and we're trying to stabilize the state and we're trying to do all these good things. Maybe that's just a cover story for the real motivation, which is nothing but, but what? The construction of death camps that killed six million people. How about that? And the obliteration of 120 million people on the planet. And the, and the, and the, and the leaving of Europe in ruins. Maybe that was the motivation. Or are we going to attribute to Hitler the highest possible motives? Say, no, it's an archetypal manifestation of Cain. Now, he's going to put up a front that says, well, I'm your savior. It's like, well, destructive people think that Cain is their savior. <laughs>